Um, good to see all of you uh, today. Um, we have some new members and some who have joined us uh, just today. So I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I'm the president of the Women's International Forum. My name is Zarina Barukati. And as this is the month we celebrate International Women's Day, I would also like to give a big shout out to the executive board members of WIF, a wonderful group of women who uplift each other um, and encourage each other. Um, please allow me to acknowledge them by name uh, from the longest serving to the newest member. Uh, we have Tanya Rattere from Jamaica, Pamela Jakovits from Cyprus, Tina Kunju from, from Mauritius, Adriana Ariola from Paraguay, Amy Gertz from Namibia, Andrea Milnarova from Slovakia, Lina Fernandez from Colombia, and uh, Saha Kabil from Egypt, Mary Fifil, Marie Fifil from Australia, Pascal Fab from uh, Belgium, and Arlene Ray from Canada. So thank you very much to all the executive uh, board members of WIF. And I also like to thank all the WIF members for your support and active participation. It's now one year since we went into a lockdown and um, since we went into the Zoom mode, but um, we've had tremendous support and feedback from WIF members, which encourages us to um, continue doing what we do. So welcome again to the WIF's March event. Our topic today is gender champions and our fight for change. How can we get to checkmate? A conversation of Judith Polga, um, international chess grandmaster and chess Olympiad champion. This year's theme for the International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge. A challenged world is an alert world and from challenge comes change. We are therefore very honored to have with us today, Judith Polga, who has chosen to challenge gender bias and limitations all her life. Uh, she has been a trailblazer in her chosen field of chess. Uh, thank you, Judith, for joining us from Budapest, Hungary. I'd also like to acknowledge Ambassador Kathleen Boguet, Hungary's uh, former ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. Uh, when she was here, Kathleen was the leader of the women's group of ambassadors, herself a change maker and trailblazer. Kathleen was instrumental in helping us to connect uh, to her fellow countrywoman, Judith. So thank you very much, Kathleen, for making this uh, possible. I would now like to invite Kathleen to introduce Judith. Uh, Kathleen, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, dear friends. It's great to see so many wonderful faces. Good friend, Sophia, I see you there as well. I miss you all, I must say, um, but actually we are still in a lockdown. Uh, a phase and um, uh, from Hungary uh, we are thinking a lot of course on the international organizations and you all how you are coping uh, and um, we just hope that uh, probably next year we can see each other in person as well. So um, it is uh, my privilege and joy to uh, introduce just uh, with a few words Judith Polga who is a great friend of mine. And if I'm happy that I came back, it's because we can see each other more often. And we even dare to meet each other in person and we can't stop talking and sort of trying to change the world. So I'm sure you heard a lot about the Polgar sisters. I mean, they are legendary sisters. Of course, in Hungary, I was brought up with this legend that there was a couple and they raised three sisters, three uh, daughters, and all the three daughters uh, became sort of geniuses and uh, became great uh, uh, chess grandmasters. So how on earth did they do that? Of course, it has been an ongoing discussion about that. And um, I'm sure you will be talking uh, with uh, Judith about uh, really how did she achieve everything what she has achieved. And is it a practice uh, which can be talent or is this the talent with practice? Uh, we, the, in the world, of course, we see the results, but probably not the effort so much. Um, and uh, they say that uh, 
uh, Judith Polgar, uh, and I'm proud to say, we say the brightest uh, woman uh, with an IQ of 170. But on the top of that, she's a wonderful mother with two wonderful children and a great husband, uh, funny, a great sense of humor, always interested. If you talk to her, you just see her eyes that she, you know, she's interested in everything. So um, you, you, you have, to, in a way, you have to do your best whenever you meet her. Uh, and I think that what she's done is exemplary because she did not um, live in the life of the women in chess or in sport, but she wanted to be a sports woman in the field of the sportsman as well. I'm sure she will talk about that more. Um, I was uh, honored to introduce Judith a few times at the United Nations uh, because she became a UN Women Planet 5050 champion. And um, uh, uh, we organized some beautiful events there. We know a few of you and, and met her there as well. Uh, what is really amazing that uh, Judith, um, after uh, finishing her career, uh, sort of uh, converted all her knowledge and talent and experience into education. And I'm sure she will talk about that as well, how important it is and how you use the knowledge, playing chess, learning chess, um, into creating better human beings, uh, into um, uh, accelerating uh, not only the talent, but creativity. So obviously, uh, Judith, uh, in uh, 1989, at the age of 12, took the lead in the adult women's world rankings. So she was 12 years old, uh, which began uh, with her name for the next 26 years. At the age of 14, she was already a two-time women chess Olympic champion. Later, as a member of the Hungarian men's team, she won two silver medals. At the age of 15 years and four months, she became a male international grandmaster, breaking Bobby Fischer age record. And at the World Championship in Las Vegas in 1999, she reached the quarterfinals. And in 2005 in San Luis, she played for the title of men's world champion. Uh, in 2005, she ranked eighth in the absolute world ranking as the first and to date the only female top 10 chess player. One says that Judith Polgar is the best ever female player in chess history. And I just want to remind you that she beat also Kasparov. I'm sure probably you, you read about that or you can even see uh, the video on the internet about that. Um, and I also would like to remind you that when uh, uh, Kasparov was asked about Judith, she, he said, she has fantastic chess talent, but she is after all a woman. It all comes down to the imperfections of a fem feminine psyche. No woman can sustain a prolonged battle. This is what Kasparov said. Oh my God, you know, yeah, how did it happen? How could it happen? But now we are all very excited about Judith because everyone has seen this movie, this series. And I see in the movements, the way, you know, the main character sits and puts her hands and so on, the movements of Judith. So I'm sure that she has been a great inspiration uh, of the main character of this uh, uh, film series. And um, uh, one just ask the question that with such a talent, knowledge, such a strength of focusing and um, such an ongoing work, what she has put into her everyday life, how on earth did she became a normal, wonderful human being, a wonderful woman? So I think these are very interesting characters of Judith. And I just would like to welcome her as a very proud, uh, Hungarian woman, uh, and I'm so happy that you can all meet her now in kind of in a personal way. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen, uh, for the introduction. As Kathleen pointed out, only one woman is currently among the top 100 uh, in the chess world rankings. Uh, a woman has never won the world championships and no one has come closer to the top than Judith Polgar. Um, to this day, she remains by far the most successful and the only woman in the top 100 ranking. Um, and I have to confess that uh, I'm personally delighted to have Judith uh, address the Women's International Forum and happy to actually meet her even though it's just Zoom because um, I've always been fascinated by the story of the Polgar sisters. Uh, their story and what their parents have done um, to make them world champions is always cited in books about sports excellence. And as a mother of two boys who fence, <laughs> I have great admiration for what the parents and they have done. So perhaps uh, uh, this is a good place to start, uh, Judith. Um, tell us, when did you realize or did you even realize that you and your sisters were part of an experiment on the part of your parents? For example, you were all homeschooled and focused exclusively on learning chess and competing. That must have been very unusual in Hungary at the time. And at what age or at what point did you become aware that you were minorities in a man's world? I'd like to welcome everybody and thanks, Kathleen, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, um, actually, I was in Singapore once when I was a kid. I <laughs> tell you about it, maybe. Uh, well, uh, we, I was growing up in a very unique uh, family as uh, I'm number three out of the sisters and actually Susan, the oldest, she is seven years older than I am. And by the time I started to play chess, she had uh, serious international results and recognition already. But still, uh, it was very difficult for us to be recognized in our own country in Hungary, because in those times in the early 80s, mid 80s, it was still not acceptable that uh, a couple of uh, two teachers, my parents, they just decided on their own to think differently, right? It was not those times when it was appreciated really, but uh, two teachers decided that they want to give a very special and unique education, so-called experiment. I more like to say it, uh, that they taught out a very special and unique lifestyle to their kids and for themselves. But I think it's very important to highlight that uh, my father thinks that it's possible to do it for every parent out of their children. But sometimes I think he neglects the fact that uh, they are both, both teachers. So for them, it was not only looking for some happiness for uh, their children as parents, but also they believed very much in their profession that as teachers, they can guide us through on the difficult and different kind of challenges. So I do believe that this, the two together, that they could be our managers, parents, and, uh, and uh, as teachers, they are actually were experimenting in their work. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it was, uh, I understood quite fast, uh, maybe when I was six, seven, that uh, my family is not very regular, for sure. <laughs> That's the last thing I would say. And uh, there were a lot of articles, media attacking my family, criticizing the way we lived, we grew up. But uh, by the time 88, when I was 12 years old and won the first uh, chess Olympiad together with my sisters and another girl, uh, I think that was the turning point where finally in Hungary also it was acknowledged that, uh, okay, they are strange, they are very strange, and we don't understand them, but okay, let them be, and actually we have to admit that they were very successful and won the gold medal for Hungary. Right, right, right. Um, and uh, and Kathleen alluded to this earlier, uh, the Netflix series, Queen's Gambit. It's, it's really uh, been an extraordinary global hit. And um, there is talk that it will be made into a Broadway production. Um, in real life, the situation is different uh, compared to what was portrayed in the Netflix series. 
sexism in the Queen's Gambit is hardly an issue. Uh, how different was it for you when you were competing? Um, and what accounts for the fact that there are very few women, uh, you know, after 30 years since you broke into the top uh, world rankings, there's very few women in the top world rankings, um, despite chess not being a physical sport. And it's a sport where there's also no referee bias. Well, I believe that stereotypes are something very seriously damaging the potentials of the girls. And, uh, and also, I mean, just a, a, an example, I want to tell you, share with you a story which happened just a few weeks ago with uh, my mother-in-law, who obviously loves uh, all the grandchildren and she doesn't know how to, to, to tell something nice to them. I have a daughter of 14 and a half. She, she's nice looking, charming, average girl. Uh, she's cute. She's smiling. She's full of heart and she's dancing. And, and actually she, she happens to be A's in school. She's just good in school. And they had the half a year closing. And I visited uh, together with Hannah, my daughter to the grandma. And the grandma looks at uh, Hannah, my daughter, and she says, well, you know, you're so beautiful and you're charming. You're such a nice person. And the top of it, you're even clever. <laughs> and then I said, well, you know, it's, it's so lovely that you say this. And I know that you love her so much, but from my vision and my mentality, it exactly goes the, starting from the other order. I'm so happy that you're clever. You're a charming person, how great it is. And the top of it, if you're beautiful, that's an extra. And I think this, this very much reflects even today's uh, attitude towards girls, that how, what are the expectations from them, right? And obviously all the girls and boys, they like to do things where they get a positive feedback, right? So I right. think it's very important to give the girls also the same opportunities, the same expectations, and let them decide whether they want to be a housewife, a mother, having a, a, a warm home, which is completely fine for me. It's just I want them, if they want, they can go the same road as the guys to have a career and maybe doesn't even want to have a family. So... Uh, and there are a lot of different small things like this that you don't have to be against ladies uh, or against girls competing. You can even say something nice as the grandma wanted, but still you're cutting the, the motivation of a girl that the priority is being smart. It's not being beautiful, right? And I've heard so many stories when the, the parents say, yeah, you have to be smart to get a good husband. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah. you have to be smart and, and yourself and excel whatever in, you want to because of your personality. And, and then the next comes. <laughs> well, that's how I was raised. And uh, that's why I have this vision, I think. But uh, in, in the chess world, unfortunately, I feel this that let's say if there is a seven-year-old talented okay. coach, let's say who is a man, even a woman, doesn't matter. How are they going to give the feedback for the talent? The feedback will be for a boy. Wow, you're so talented. You can beat the world champion, Magnus Carlsen. To the same talented qualities, what the boy was showing, if there is a girl, they will give the feedback that, Wow, you're so fantastic. You're absolutely talented. You can even become the women's world champion or even maybe almost Judith Polgar. But that's the max, max, max. And usually they don't even take it seriously. Yeah. So the problem is, I mean, translating it to an average language, it's like for a boy, you say that you're so talented that you can become a Nobel Prize winner. And to a girl, you say that you're going to have a PhD. Yeah. And the expectations determine a lot of things with your, in your brain, how and where you want to reach. And I think many of these small details and small things does make the difference. I mean, I was talking, for example, with one of the world champions, uh, Kostenyuk from Russia, 
And she was asking me, she was writing an article herself and asking me similar questions, what you just asked, that why? And then I asked her back some of the questions and it was very clear that when she was 14, her teacher who was man, he didn't believe in her at all. He said, okay, go for the girls, play chess, go to another coach. So there was, it was very, very clear. She was not working enough. She was working maybe half an hour, two hours a day. Then at 14, you have to spend really many hours because you're serious about it. So they don't expect from girls to take it so seriously as a profession than from a boy. And that's bad because obviously they are not going to reach the same result. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you correctly pointed out that expectations play a role uh, because then it's, in your mind, a child's mind, you can only go so far. So then why put in the effort, right? And the other thing that you said about chess, I think which is true in any sport and even in a profession like the foreign service, I used to be a foreign service officer, I used to be a diplomat. And I can say that people, I don't know, I think sometimes they look at you as a woman and say, oh, do I want to invest in this woman? Because eventually she's going to get married and she's going to get kids. So maybe, you know, I'll prioritize the males. So these are the kind of, um, you know, thinking that uh, often limits the progress of women. So the other thing that came to my mind as you were speaking was the environment. Um, you did not grow up in an environment where people put limits on you. I mean, you were homeschooled in your formative years. So you were protected from biases and discriminations about the limitations of the female. Um, so if we extend that logic, do you think girls benefit from being in a single sex school where, you know, they, they, they won't be limited by saying that, you know, your classmate is a boy, he will definitely go further than you. And girls then internally develop this self-limiting um, beliefs. W what is your opinion on that? I don't know. Just a few years ago, I visited a girl's uh, uh, elementary school uh, in London and, and they've asked me also and they told me that what are the pluses and minuses from their perspective. As I don't have experience in this, uh, I mean, at home we had a girl's school because I had two other sisters, <laughs> but that's quite different. So it's for me, it's very hard to, to say anything because I, I don't have enough information on this. Uh, I'm not sure I'm for it or against it, really. I, I believe very much in, uh, in open-minded uh, teachers who really look uh, with the gross mind uh, attitude towards the kids and how to inspire the kids to actually make them or keep them or motivate and, and fuel the drive they have. I think those are the most important elements. And, um, and really, I think regarding uh, this question, whether should we limit or people limit the girls or not, I think we simply, all of us, girls, boys, adults, ladies, men, they all have their, their duty or to do in everyday things, the smallest thing to the biggest. So it's, uh, it is something important. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I will open it up to our participants because there are several people waiting to ask. Um, I saw your interview in the CNN panel last year in November with Christiana Manpur, um, in which you and Gary Kasparov were interviewed by her. Um, and um, Gary Kasparov in that uh, interview said that when you, Judith, were competing at the world stage, none of the men looked at you as a woman, but purely as a chess player. Uh, but he also said that chess does not fit women. It's not suited to women. Um, what is your reaction to that? Well, with Gary Kasparov, I have a long, long, long history. <laughs> I met him first in 1988 at the Chess Olympiad, right after, uh, well, during the, the event, we were actually talking and, the family was talking to him, which was a huge thing in my life. And actually after the, uh, the last game finished and before the closing ceremony, a Hungarian journalist went to him and asked him that, well, what do you think about Judith's performance? She made the best performance of the Chess Olympiad, men and women included, because out of 13 games, I won 12 games and only one draw. 
And uh, Gary was replying that, well, I think, well, Judith, absolutely, she's, she, she's going to be a women's world champion. That's not a question. And it was seen that he was really appreciating my efforts and games and results. And he really believed that I'm a very special talent. And then the journalist was going on, keeping asking the questions. So do you think you're all ever going to be playing against Judith in a tournament? And then he was like, he, it was such an unexpected question to him, it seemed, that he said, well, no, 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 no. Well, it's nothing against Judith, but it's, 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 no, it's, it's, it's not for ladies. The, this, <laughs> this tension of the game is, is so high. But why is that, that he said something like this? I, this is what I was wondering in the last few years after I received this video. And uh, it goes back to education because he comes from the Soviet Union where in chess, it was absolutely something that you don't consider ladies as competitors. They are belong somewhere else. It's also a true fact that there were no ladies who were really competing against men being successful between uh, men competitors. So it was also kind of a fact, right? But uh, but I must say I was I was very pleased to to hear and see on, live on CNN that he admitted that we all make mistakes. <laughs> so actually, he admitted that yes, in those times, those years, I was just beginning to be on the top of the ladies' world uh, in chess, and he said, yeah, that time we didn't know that she's going to be so good, and I think it was something uh, very nice. Uh, uh, learning process for Gary and trust me Gary is a typical chauvinistic guy <laughs> I mean he, when he comes in I mean he really like controls and penetrates the whole uh, whole ballroom or something like if he comes into a room you notice it make sure that you notice it so I think it was for me it was amazing that how his growing uh, process in his mind developed and actually once in 2001, before I beat him actually in the game, I played with him two draws that none of us won. It was balanced. And after that, he invited me to, to train with him. And, and that was something, a great acknowledgement. I understood that this was the moment when he admitted that, okay, you're not a lady from, from a chess point of view, but you're just simply a good a very interesting player. So I'm interested in uh, how you see on the board. And we had a training session. And that was the turning point uh, from his point of view. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, very interesting response. Uh, we have several people who want to ask a question. Uh, I have a list of yeah, uh, names here and I will call them. Uh, when I call them, they can unmute their microphones and pose the questions themselves. Uh, so we have uh, first Elena. Um, till the, I can't pronounce the last name. I'm sorry, Elena. Can you unmute yourself and uh, pose the question? Elena? Yes. Hello. 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 Uh, 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 it's Elena, great to see uh, you. Too. Uh, my question was. Uh, uh, what time do you think is the best for kids to start learn play chess? Uh, and uh, is it is there any age when it's too late to start to learn play chess? That's my question. Thank you. I believe that uh, for kids you can start four or five years old that uh, you can start uh, teaching them chess but actually there are so many different kind of programs uh, included worldwide that uh, I know from a Colombian uh, teacher who is actually using it already starting from age two Obviously, you shouldn't think about having the chessboard out on the table and teaching them chess, but using for skill building uh, aspect, like the big the chessboard, like a huge one with the, like a carpet, a rug. And uh, so there is possibilities already to, to show some of the elements for learning process for kids. And well, I think uh, you can still learn anytime. It's, it's ageless. 
the game. But obviously, if you start learning when you're 20 or later, then don't be so optimistic <laughs> and cheat yourself that you're going to become a world champion. Thank you. Thank you can you still enjoy the game uh, just as much uh, than as if you start in early age. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, we have uh, next uh, Didi Cutler. Uh, and after that will be Lina Fernandez. So Didi, if you can unmute yourself. It is uh, really, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And it's a real treat to meet uh, Judith Pogar. Uh, I became fascinated by uh, the series, The Queen's Gambit. And I wanted to ask you how accurate is the movie? Uh, the aspect, the, the time when uh, you were at that boarding school or the, uh, the school, uh, are there parts of the movie which are completely inaccurate? Um, and many congratulations to you. Thank you. Well, the movie is based on a, on a book, right? So it's a fiction book from 84. And uh, in 84, I was just eight years old. So I, it, the movie is not, the movie series is not about me. It's just when I was seeing the series, I also had some deja vu feelings uh, in some parts. Well, the, the movie I loved because it's so professional and it's so accurate in details. Uh, obviously the interior design and the style uh, and the dresses and the hairstyle and all those things that they are, those things are authentic in the series, that's quite okay. And I think it's, it's expected kind of, but there are very rare situations when you see the exact same uh, fine detailed work in a profession such as chess, because chess is generally mostly, I think more than 50% of the films and series, you can see the element of chess either seeing a chessboard or strategic or fight or, uh, or war or love, whatever, right? But in this movie, it was Gary Kasparov who made some of the key uh, chess games of the movie. I was also discussing, he was very proud of himself that he created those games and it was really an excellent work. Uh, there was Bruce Pandolfini who is uh, from the States. He's a known chess uh, coach for many years, he was the one who taught the actors, the movements, the, the moves, how to behave, how a chess atmosphere is set up, where, who is looking there, <laughs> how you make the moves. And obviously, uh, for sure, they were also watching my body movements and body language, my looks, how, how I, I have my hand and all those things. And, uh, but I think it's at least 95% authentic from chess point of view as well. Like the setup of a chess tournament, pieces on the chess board, the way Beth Harmon, Anya was, uh, was making the moves. Because there is a movement actually that uh, sometimes I can notice if somebody is, what kind of player he, she is. Because I see that uh, just looking the moves, where to put the pieces. And here it was, uh, it was very clear that uh, the main actor, actress was, was playing it with full self-confidence. And when I talked with uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, she told me that I was very amazed how well she and also some of the other actors played being a chess player, the role of a chess player. And she said that, uh, well, for her it was, uh, as she was a dancer, for her, it was like a choreography. And that's how she learned the, the moves. And uh, there are some small uh, uh, facts which, which are a little bit exaggerating. Like, I don't know how much you remember when uh, Beth Harmon is sitting on the floor against three guys and playing simultaneously against them. But there also, they had the clock. So for visually, it looked so good. But normally we don't play simultaneously with speed uh, chess, for example. But uh, the one when she's visualizing on the ceiling, the chessboard, we don't have this uh, hallucination or something, but we do see actually 
blindfolded the board and we do talk with each other without seeing the board mm -hmm. it's it's usually 2d uh, front of us that's how we see the board so actually i love the movie because first of all it was very authentic from chess point of view as well and also that it was a great inspiration to the world to see that chess is something exciting thank you i guess the the, the part where she sees the chess moves on the ceiling it's probably an attempt to say that you visualize it in your head before. Is that is that correct to say you exactly you visualize the movie? exactly? And and in the movie we don't realize it while we are watching it, but actually I've seen many of the summaries on different elements and parts. And for example, they show it in a few occasions that she's looking up the ceiling, and they always gave a different angle how to show it. So the, the movie series were so, so fine tuned from every way that that's why I think, uh, and, and Bess Harmon as a character personality, she was very unique. She was not the classical beauty, but she was this very controversial uh, character. Uh, so that, that's why I think uh, we love the, the series so much. Yeah, so if you have not uh, watched the Netflix series, it's time to go and watch it. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> well, <laughs> we were spoilers a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have Lena uh, next, and after Lena, there's Tracy. So Lena, can you go ahead? Yes, thank you, Judith, for joining us today. And I'm a little bit curious more about your childhood. How do you remember your childhood? And did you always like chess? Did you have the opportunity to choose something else that you would like to do at that point of your life? Or And probably, can you describe a little bit if you feel comfortable to share with us how was a normal day for Judith on, during that early age of your life? Uh... First question, what was the first question? That uh, if I could choose something else. Yeah, well, I liked chess from the, from the very beginning. And I think the reason is, first of all, because my parents were uh, having already a lot of experience with my two other, older sisters. Uh, obviously, kids like games. And uh, my parents, they are exceptionally good uh, teachers. So they know how to so-called trick the kid uh, to, to make them <laughs> like something. And uh, the main idea is that they always gave the positive feedback, how good I made this move. And they were practically raising me in a gross mindset. I don't know how much you know about Carol Dweck's uh, idea, mm -hmm. but it's like always focusing the exact move or the exact uh, happenings what I did. So in this from this point of view, you can, you always get the inspiration and the motivation to go further and challenge yourself again and again and again and again. So, and also I think I like the game because I started to become very successful very fast. Like I started when I was five, more or less the moves. At the age of six, I was winning the round the block championship. Uh, and the age of nine, I was uh, winning my first international tournament in New York, which uh, with that result, I was on the front page of the New York Times. I got my first 1000 bucks. So it was, uh, I, I was becoming too successful uh, very fast. And obviously, what else do you need for a kid <laughs> than to win one game after another and being successful? That's like uh, better than any drugs. <laughs> any doping right and um, well how the days went it's uh, well in the beginning it was little chess 10 minutes half an hour and then that's how we increased so by the time I was eight nine years old I was playing already six seven hours uh, chess later on I started to do sports every day two hours I was playing table tennis for quite some time and then we had a period of time to prepare for school in the first few years, elementary school, those were not uh, very time consuming. Later on, it was, uh, it was more time consuming, but my parents were not uh, focusing on, uh, on school subjects uh, being so important because, well, I was 12 when I won uh, being part of the Olympic champion team. So things yeah. happened in my case too fast. <laughs> 
but for a, yeah, but it's a, it's a fascinating how you mentioned the growth mindset and uh, how a little success and motivation can, you know, encourage uh, the child to continue and persevere in a field. Um, thank yeah, it's you. It's underestimated, I think, or it's uh, not, not enough people know about this uh, aspect. Exactly. The challenge, it must be challenging, but not too challenging. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have Tracy next with a question. Tracy? Thank you so much. What a fascinating life you've led. <laughs> and so many, you've, you've introduced so many different uh, ideas about education, chess, and all the rest of it. I, I wanted to sort of pull those together and ask you maybe a, a three-part question, but it's in one, one example. In Ecuador, mm -hmm. uh, the municipality began to distribute little plastic chess sets and was encouraging the community centers and kids to, to do chess, more or less to develop uh, critical thinking skills. And then when they changed uh, mayors and things moved on, then an NGO tried to pick this up and their, their justification was to say, this is kind of like in the old days when we taught logic or Latin, or maybe what the rich schools do in teaching coding, but we want to get this thinking um, trained early. So I guess the, the three parts of the question are uh, to see what they are doing compared to what your parents did, aside from this constant practice at a very early age, what else did your family do? That's one part. The second is, what do you think of those kinds of initiatives and, and would you back them? And more or less, I guess you've answered uh, you know, earlier, the better would be good. But the third part of the question goes to this uh, area of um, of the differences between the sexes. When they had these little plastic chess sets and they only had a few, um, they allowed the kids to take them home. And the kids who took them home were the boys. The, the girls didn't take home the chess sets to practice. or They were told, take them home and teach your parents or take them home and, and use them. And the girls didn't, which was really interesting. And just wanted to pull all those different threads together about is something like that an early initiative to help just general thinking skills? Um, as you were saying, there's lots of things you can do in those early years programs you saw in Colombia where they're, you know, they help kids just think if then, if then, anticipate, you know, things, how beneficial that would be in the form of chess and um, what you could do, what we could do to actually encourage more, um, more kids, girls and boys to, to actually participate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a, it's a complex questions and, and a few questions, so I will try to answer it. First of all, it's great that they had this initiative in Ecuador to, to give out chess sets. But I think we have to clear some of the basic things. And I always uh, tell this and clarify it for people to understand it, because uh, chess has a 1,500 years old uh, history. Their chess was in different parts of, uh, of different times used for different things. Uh, so in education, there are quite a few different uh, ways of using it, especially the way you are asking for, for everyday knowledge, for skill building, for something that they can use outside of the chessboard. So there are two basic differences when you have the chess coaches, not even a necessarily grandmaster, master, they can be lower, but they are chess masters, chess coaches who go into schools or, uh, or preschools even, and they are picking out the chess set with some stories, but they're actually focusing on the chess activity on the chess board, right? And they color the story. So it's 80% chess and 20% storytelling, coloring, uh, the games, uh, bringing in maybe some numbers, some math and logic and so on. And the other way of doing it is to give chess as a tool for teachers who are actually going to be using chess for developing their everyday skills they need, 80% or 90%. And it's only 10 or 20% going to be happening on the chess board and chess moves. And I think this is very important to understand. So the activity what happened in Ecuador, giving out chess set is an old fashioned kind of thinking. And from that, you cannot expect a great change in mindset or whatever. It's for the kids who like to play games, 
who are interested, they're going to grab it, take it home, play with the parents or whatever. So just give out something, some tool without telling them exactly what to do with it. It can be also not dangerous, but, but it can, it goes on itself and then you will see what, what's going to be the end of it. And it's a great game. So don't misunderstand me. It's something great that kids were getting chess set. I have, for example, a program running in Hungary from uh, 2013. It's part of the educational system and uh, it's an optional subject. So the uh, elementary school where the principal decides they want to have the chess palace program, which is our program of my foundation, then they can choose it and have it in, in a classroom. And we do use, we give classes and courses to teachers to understand how and what is the best way we believe the, to use chess in the classroom using the, the, the numbers, the, the algorithm, different uh, things, the chessboard, the coordinates, uh, how to, to use the chess pieces with numbers, because in chess we have the values of each piece, like pawn verse one, knight and bishop verse three, a rook is five, queen is nine, and then we have the king, which we use in our math uh, examples as a jolly joker, so it can be replaced with any number which we don't have in the chess. Or we are making all kinds of different games on the chessboard, throwing out letters and then pick a piece and then uh, take the piece, the, the uh, alphabet uh, letters and then form a word out of it. Or we have many different uh, uh, patterns which they can use and make them learn uh, daily skills which they are needing in everyday life diagonals, right and left and above you, under you, all these things very interestingly and gamefully we can teach the kids. But this is one way of doing it and we don't, we are not the only ones with this kind of attitude. There are, in Spain, there are a lot of different initiatives, in South America, in Argentina, in Colombia, I said, I think Paraguay, and uh, some of the other countries. And then there are other countries who use chess as chess. So they have the chess board, they have the chess pieces, they have the booklets of chess diagrams with the chess pieces on it. And those going and focusing much more on the logical thinking, on the combinational skills, on the decision-making skills, taking responsibility and those things. But it is very important to understand that there are many different ways so when we say chess in school, don't think only that we have a chess board in the school. <laughs> no, the chess with including many different integration into different uh, subjects. So it's very important to, to know this. And, uh, and now we are actually progressing pretty well internationally. I'm uh, an advisor in the World uh, Federation on the education matters, also in the European uh, parliament, I just gave a lecture uh, on benefits of chess. So we are progressing and it's very important, I think, right now, that's, that's what I'm trying to, to give the message everywhere, that I think we really need different platforms where we can talk about the, the values, the benefits for the different age groups of kids and giving ideas for teachers and institutes. What are the menu? What are the different ways of using chess for different age groups? Thank you. Thank you so much. How complete. What an eye opener. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. We have two more questions and we have about seven minutes. So uh, let me, if you allow me, let me call on Elbrun Kimmelman, uh, who had a question. And then after that, the last one will be in uh, Lydia Elbrun. Um, I'm curious as to whether you have expectations or teaching goals for your own children in terms of chess. I mean, obviously, it must be a family activity. <laughs> uh, I was uh, playing 33 years of chess after that I retired from competitive chess. Yeah. My children's career was much shorter <laughs> because they started when they were in kindergarten and uh, they practically stopped after grade two, like when they were eight or so. 
And there are different reasons for that. First of all, I was not uh, uh, teaching them so passionately and so actively and so concentratedly as my parents, my kids. I gave them as an option and I was offering them and we went to some chess tournaments. But also uh, to have a mom like me for them going to chess tournament, it was also something that people are giving very unrealistic expectations from them, which is not helping them stay in the sport. And I was not pushing it. So I wanted them to learn at least a little because I really believe that it, it is for their benefits, for their thinking skills. I think it would be still okay to go further and, and, uh, and do some ch more chess activities and it would be beneficial for them. But I specifically didn't want to, to push it and force it because uh, it is a very strange setup when you have a, such a successful mom like they have in chess. No, I mean, it, you talk about male-female, and often I think uh, men who are terrifically successful in their businesses are um, very challenged about whether they direct their boys, and you know, for many men nowadays, they're girls, they take them equally, but I mean, just traditionally, uh, whether to, you know, uh, require almost or have that intensity of feeling to make the child uh, mm -hmm. follow, and you know, the other side of the coin is, of course, if you're really good at it, you're the one who can pave the way. <laughs> so, you know, they theoretically could take advantage of that and, and do even better. So it's, I mean, it's a loaded question. I meant it to be. <laughs> yes, it's, of course, I mean, we can take any profession, any sport, right? But I think in some ways, profession is, is different than if you, if you want to have it in sport to follow your parents. I think that's not the same. I think if you have you becoming a doctor, a lawyer, or a engineer in your footsteps of the parents, it's it's different than being in the sport successful. It is possible, but uh, I I didn't push it on purpose, and I didn't want to them to become uh, chess professionals. And uh, and I know that I became so good because I didn't go to schools, and I was so much focused, and the whole family was so much focused. On, uh, on me and my sister's success. So, and I didn't want to give up my career. My husband didn't want to give his career. He's a veterinarian. And we believe that we want to raise our kids differently. If they would have been really hooked on the game, I think I wouldn't stop them. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't stop them probably. And I would give them the opportunity and the trainers and, and everything, but they didn't hook on the, the game so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so one last question from Anna. Uh, I think she has a difficulty with the camera, so I will ask the question for her. Uh, her question is, Judith, how do you deal with adrenaline during the competition? And uh, second question is, in a competition, what is the most difficult uh, moment? Uh, in a competition, what is the most difficult moment? Well, when you don't have enough time to prepare for it, <laughs> that's one very annoying, or you feel that you're not prepared for, uh, for the exact game, that's, uh, that's uh, painful. And the most difficult, uh, if you lose uh, with, with a very unnecessary mistake, that's, that's difficult to handle. If your opponent just played better and outplayed you and one because he, she was better, and uh, that's by far not so painful. Uh, what was the other question? Well, what, the other question was about adrenaline. How do you deal with adrenaline during uh, competition? Uh, that's okay. That's okay. If you prepare well, then that's not a problem. That actually can be stimulating uh, and uh, even support your performance. Well, thank you so much, uh, Judith, uh, for this very interesting one hour uh, where you shared with us your story, your struggles to break gender biases and barriers. I can say that as a mother, I had always looked up to the story of your family. Um, you are an example and inspiration to many young girls and women out there. Um, so thank you also to everyone for joining us today. 
I'd like to leave you all with the thought, uh, since this is uh, March and International Women's Day, with the thought of how will you help forge a gender equal world, uh, celebrate women's uh, achievement, raise awareness against bias, take action for equality. Um, so this is the thoughts that I would like to leave you with because everyone can, can play a role. Not everyone is Judith Polga, but in our small ways, we all can play a role and make a difference. So thank you very much for that. Um, keep healthy and safe and remember to join us on April 15 for our next event uh, with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Economy where we discuss geopolitical importance of China and its future. Uh, so thank you very much once again, Judith. And thank you, Kathleen, for thank you. helping us make this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.